to you, O God. All praise to you, all glory to you. We thank you that the end has been written from the beginning. That history truly is your story. That you are sovereign. That every star obeys your voice. And even the fallen angels will bow and give you praise. They will confess that you are Lord. Lord, we pray that our own hearts would be in the company of those who willingly bow. In surrender and faith to you. We know that is glory to you and it is infinite joy to us. God, we pray as we look to your word this morning that our hearts would be gripped by the truths that you have laid out for the future. That these would have impact for us even as we live today. You've given these things in your word so that we might read, so that we might believe, so that we might know, so that we might live differently. And we pray that all of this would have uh, that effect in our hearts this morning. We ask now for your help by the Holy Spirit who penned the words we will study to do work in us for your glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you're finding your seats, find your way to the last book of the Bible in the 13th chapter. This morning we will be studying Revelation 13, 1 to 6. The title of this morning's sermon is The Man of the Hour. And the topic of this message this morning is the Antichrist. Everybody in the world admits there are problems and we love solutions to problems. Sometimes we come up with solutions that are more costly than the problem itself. It would be great to have solutions with no cost. But the problem of humanity is the problem of sin. It is an infection, internal and inherent in each one of us by nature, working its way out in the various nefarious activities of our lives. Every single human being is affected. Every single human being acts out of a sinful nature, and it creates a world of corruption. We all feel it. We all perpetrate it. The world knows that there are problems. The world can sweep them under the rug. The world can come up with superficial solutions. And you and I who follow Jesus Christ know that there is a solution to the fundamental problem of humanity. And that solution was not free. It came at infinite cost. In fact, our plight was so bad that the only solution for our problem was that God himself would take on flesh and actually pay for our sins hanging on a cross. That's how bad our sin was. It wasn't a shallow problem that could be cleaned up, forgotten about, overridden, winked at. It was a problem of epic and infinite proportions that required a radical, supernatural, otherworldly, and infinite solution. We need the gospel. And what cost does the gospel come to us? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is a free gift in the love of God given by grace through faith. It's totally free. And believing the gospel will at the same time cost you everything. It means surrendering your life, taking up your cross and following Christ. Now what you lose, everything about your old life, wasn't worth keeping And what you gain is everything you were made for. It is the best deal. What if the world could solve its problems without Jesus? What if the world could clean things up? Make things better? Make the world a better place? What if we could have world peace, but we didn't have to repent? We didn't have to deal with that holiness stuff. We didn't have to turn away from idolatries and immoralities and sorceries and corruptions. We could could just be who we are and everybody be okay. The world has always craved Jesus-less solutions to its problems. In the last 
week of world history. We think of a a week of years in the last seven years of world history. The world will find a Jesusless solution. The solution will be an anti-Jesus. A Jesus that doesn't demand turning away from sin. A Jesus that promises world peace and prosperity and happiness and, and reprieve from that pesky wrath of God that just keeps coming down out of heaven. The world craves a solution like the Antichrist and God will give to the world that counterfeit. Let's read together Revelation 13, 1 to 6. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain fatally. And his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled and followed after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to do war against him? And there was given to him a mouth speaking great boasts and blasphemies. And authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. What we have here is an introduction to a, a picture of descriptions of the Antichrist. The Antichrist seems something like a, a figure of mythology. In American culture, people who are sort of casually familiar with the Bible and entertained by apocalyptic movies. But this is a real historical figure of the future. And and it's not a new doctrine in the book of Revelation. The doctrine of the Antichrist does not show up in this last book of the Bible. In fact, God has wanted his people to know about this future man on the world stage for thousands of years. Details about the Antichrist show up in parts of four chapters of the book of Daniel. Jesus talked about the Antichrist in Matthew 24. He said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken through the prophet Daniel, when you see him standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Jesus warned about this one. The apostle John in his letter had already been warning the people in his churches about this. He wrote in 1 John 2.18, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, he had already been talking to them about it. The Apostle Paul taught the Thessalonian believers about the Antichrist. He writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. There's a long section in a letter from a pastor to a church about ground he had already covered related to this one called the Antichrist. What do we learn from all of this? God wants us to know about this man. God has revealed who he is, what he's like, and what he will do for our benefit. It's important for us to ask the question, why is this in our Bibles? 
Why do I need to know about this? And I trust that in our unfolding of the descriptions of the Antichrist, we will have good ideas about what this ought to do for us today. Let's look at six descriptions of the Antichrist, beginning in verse 1 with his identity. Yes, this morning, I'm going to give you the identity of the Antichrist. I don't know who it is. I'm not going to tell you a name. But we do know from verse 1 that he is Satan's man for the final push. Satan has been at war against God and against God's people. We've been looking at that through Revelation chapter 12. And Satan uses means, tangible human means on the earth to accomplish his purposes. And he will, in this last push of his rebellion against God and his Christ. He is Satan's man for the final push. Look at verse 1. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Here we have Satan poised, ready for his last attempt to prevent Jesus Christ from taking the throne of the earth. This is a vision. This is a graphic depiction for the Apostle John of real future historical events. And this graphic depiction is given in a vision with symbols. Satan is not actually a dragon, but he is represented as a dragon. Just like the nation of Israel was represented as a woman. And so here, the Antichrist will be represented as a terrifying beast. But here we see Satan, the dragon, ready for his last attempt. He's said to be standing on the shore or standing on the sands of the sea. Kind of between the depths and the earth where humanity dwells. He's ready to bring something out of the depths onto the world stage. And we see that in verse 1. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. And this vision here, a vision of a dragon and the sea, these are representations of a future historical reality. The beast here is not literally an animal, although the vision presents a man in beastly terms. He is said here to come up out of the sea. I believe this is probably a reference to the abyss. Look back at chapter 11. We got a foreshadowing of his activities. This is the story of those two witnesses we looked at some time back. Verse 7 says, When they finished their witness, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Chapter, seven, chapter 11 looks forward to the events we'll start to talk about this morning. And there it is described as the beast coming up out of the abyss. There seems to be an equal sign between the abyss described in chapter 11 and the sea that John sees in chapter 13. Flip over to chapter 17 and verse 8. This same equal sign is given. Revelation 17, 8 says, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and then go to destruction. The location of the abyss is the location of the demonic powers. Where those who were incarcerated for some time were were sent to wait for their release. Where demons were released as a gigantic horde during the tribulation period. And now this beast is said to come up out of the abyss. He is identified here with ten horns and seven heads. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, back in chapter 12, verse 3, we saw that the dragon had seven heads and ten horns. What does that tell us? That tells us that the Antichrist, this beast coming up out of the abyss, is doing Satan's bidding. He now has the ten horns and seven heads that Satan himself was displayed with in the last chapter. He will represent the dragon on the earth. Horns in the Bible are symbols of power and strength. They are ten kingdoms. We know this from chapter 17 and verse 10. They are kings, John says. Verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. 
And this all harkens back to our study of the book of Daniel we did a couple of years ago. Daniel 7.7 7 tells us, John looked in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. It had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that went before it. And it had ten horns. Same entity, same being, same person. Daniel 7.24 records, As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them. He'll be different from the previous ones, and he will subdue three of them. The vision in chapter 7 of Daniel gives us the ten horns being the ten kings, the final confederation of this rebellious empire. And in Daniel chapter 2, we get the vision of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in the succeeding world empires of future history from Daniel's point. And the bottom of that statue was a mixed iron and pottery with ten toes. In verse verse 44 of Daniel 2, those ten toes are described as kingdoms with kings. And it is in their days, the days of the ten toes or the ten kings, that the stone cut out without hands, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ out of heaven will come and smash the statue and establish his kingdom forever. So what we're talking about with the Antichrist in Revelation 13 and these ten kings, the ten horns, we are talking about the last chapter of human history as we know it now. The last few years before the establishment of Christ's kingdom on the earth. He is identified further as having seven heads. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. These are the seven successive satanically driven empires that sought the destruction of Israel. They sought to prevent the Messiah from coming into the world, either the first time or the second time. Those seven empires are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the second iteration of Rome, Rome 2.0. We discover further here in verse 1 that on his heads were blasphemous names. That is, this beast, this antichrist, proudly displays his arrogance. He is not afraid to disrespect Almighty God. Let's look at a second description. Let's look at his character. This is found for us in verse 2. He is characterized by a climactic conglomeration of evil empires. Look how the beast is described. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. This is a crazy looking animal. I do not recommend you try to draw this. The beast here represents a man and an empire. In Daniel's visions, these were successive empires, and and empires were headed by an emperor. You have the man at the top of the kingdom who is the king representing the kingdom. You think of Pol Pot, you think of the Khmer Rouge, you think of Adolf Hitler, you think of the Third Reich. They are, in a sense, one and the same. The, The empire is embodied in the man at the top. This final evil empire is embodied in a man, and And in verse 1 of Revelation 13, we see the vision picking up from the visions of Daniel that that repeat this idea of a beast as an empire, as a kingdom. And by the time you get to verse 3, it is clear that a man is in view, not just the empire. In fact, in verse 3, look there, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain fatally. You have singular personal pronouns and a mortal wound on an individual. Down in verse 8, you see this man receiving worship. All who are on the earth will worship him. And then in verse 18 of chapter 13, you discover that he has a number, 666, and it is the number of a man. What we're talking about here is, is not just a pictorial depiction of empires, of kingdoms, but of a very evil man at the top of man's, mankind's last evil empire. The beast is a man who controls the empire. He controls the ten kings of that final satanic attempt, a final murderous plot to prevent Messiah's reign on the earth. And it is characterized here as a leopard, a bear, and a lion. 
In Daniel chapter 7, we get those same three animals depicting three successive empires in reverse order, a lion, a bear, a leopard. Daniel's looking forward, John's looking backward, so they come in reverse order. And then in Daniel 7, the fourth beast goes undescribed. The, the first beast in, in that order of four was a lion with wings. That was the empire of Babylon. And then in Daniel's vision, you had a bear with a rib in its teeth, just trampling over everything. That's Medo-Persia. Followed by a four-winged leopard. That was the, the fleet-footed blitzkrieg of the Grecian empire under Alexander the Great. And after those three beasts, you had a, a fourth beast that Daniel simply calls dreadful and terrifying with ten horns. That's the beast out of the abyss we're talking about here in Revelation 13. John's vision in Revelation 13 gives this fourth terrifying beast the characteristics of the first three in a ghastly conglomeration of all the evil empires that went before it. What is the point of this in the vision? It means that this final empire will have the strength of the lion, the strength of the Babylonian empire. It will have the brutality of the bear, of the Medo-Persians, and it will have the lightning speed of the leopard in the Grecian empire. It will have all of these together. This final empire with Antichrist at the helm will be limitless in ambition, possessing unstoppable destructive power and unmitigated cruelty. This last of Daniel's prophesied empires will be the worldwide government of the satanically empowered leader. Notice his power. This is the third description of the Antichrist. There at the end of verse 2, the dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. Where does, guy, where does this guy come from? What elections did he win? What, what city council was he a part of? Was he part of the local school board and work his way up to world emperor? How did he get there? We're not given the details of his rise to power, but we are given the source. The source of his power and his authority is Satan himself. And you remember in Matthew 4, Satan sought to derail Christ in his purposes. In Matthew 4, 9, Satan said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And in a sense, they were Satan's to give. Satan, the God of this world, he is the one behind all the, the wickedness of humanity. Of course, he's on a short leash under God's sovereignty. He can only go as far as God allows. And to Jesus, all those things rightly belong. But Jesus was going to go to the cross first before he reigns as conquering king. Satan's attempt to undo that, Satan's attempt to undermine Jesus' purpose and derail him from going to the cross, is reflected in Satan's offer to the anti-Jesus. Satan will offer the kingdoms of the world to a man in the future. You remember that in Luke 22.3, the gospel writer records for us that Satan indwelt Judas. That's a scary thought. Uh, we're aware of demon possession in the scriptures. But what about the chief indwelling Judas to betray Christ? What is behind the Antichrist? All the cunning, the deceit, the treachery, the murderous intent, and the blasphemous evil that belonged to the devil himself will energize this final world leader. And the world will fall for it. Satan now acts like an angel of light, and the world falls for it. Then, as Satan's man for the last hour, will pull off the greatest heist in history. He'll steal the world population for his own glory. The world will believe that he is the answer to their problems. Consider what the world will have endured up to this point in the tribulation. Massive global cataclysms. The wrath of God and the Lamb poured out on rebellious earth dwellers. Wars, famines, earthquakes... Hordes of demons inflicting agony, flying stinging locusts, and a 200 million piece demonic cavalry of supernatural horses. In all of this, earth dwellers would rather die than repent of their evil ways. Do you remember the kings and the slaves will all hide themselves in the rocks according to Revelation 6? 
And they will know it is the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb that is being poured out in the seal judgments. And they will say, who can stand the wrath of God and the Lamb? And they would rather die with the rocks falling on them than turn from their sins. Is there someone who can rescue us from the wrath of God? Is there some hero? Is someone with supernatural ability to counter these supernatural events that are falling on us from heaven? The beast out of the abyss, supernaturally empowered by Satan, will rally the rebellious world to his banner. It seems that some undeniably powerful miracle would be needed to prove his credentials. And we see that. Look down at verse 3. Here's a fourth description of the Antichrist, his resurrection. His resurrection is a convincing imitation. Look at verse 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain fatally, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled and followed after the beast. The Antichrist will be killed and will rise again. We might ask, are his death and resurrection real? Is this some sort of elaborate deception? Is, is there some newfangled technology involved? Is this a deep fake? It doesn't seem, according to the text, to be a resuscitation. Now look back at chapter 5 and verse 6. With the exact same phrase used of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, this is the heavenly scene. I saw in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. There the Lord Jesus is standing as if slain. That doesn't mean he wasn't really slain, but it just looks like it. He, he's literally standing as slain, standing as one who was slain. That exact same phrase is used here of Antichrist. doesn't seem to be fake here. There, there seems to be something unnatural, supernatural at work. Look down at verse 12 of Revelation 13. We'll learn about the second beast. That second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in the earth to worship the first ba- beast whose fatal wound was healed. There again, it is called a fatal wound. Look down at the end of verse 14. This one had the wound of the sword and has come to life. This seems like a a very serious, fatal death wound that is then overcome. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2.9 that This beast's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. And if we back up and just think about the chronology for a moment, the Antichrist will show up for approximately a seven-year period. And at first, he is a world leader. He's one of the ten kings, although he kills off three of them. So there are seven left, and he, the seventh, becomes an eighth. And then he's the world leader of all of them. The, what had been a ten-king federation now is subsumed under his rule. Second, this one will make a covenant with Israel. He will get peace in the Middle East. Daniel tells us that this is a firm covenant he makes with Israel. And if you think right now about what it would take to actually have peace in the Middle East that would endure, uh, the Arab world would not be happy with anybody saying, Israel, you're going to live in peace and safety. In fact, why don't you build a temple right on the dome of the rock? How does that sound? (laughs) That would not go over well today. What kind of cunning, what kind of strategy, what kind of brilliance, what kind of rapport will be required for someone to be on the world stage and actually rebuild a temple on the Temple Mount, given today's current political environment? Whatever the world is like whenever this happens, and it could be next week or it could be a thousand years from now, we don't know. 
But you can already see in our day how difficult it would be and how wondrous it would seem if somebody solved that problem. The world leader comes onto the stage. He makes peace in the Middle East. Thirdly, he receives a fatal wound and comes back to life. That would be stunning. In the midst of all the death and catastrophe that would be happening during the tribulation, the hero of the world that's bringing world peace and bringing everybody together under one government is then killed. It would be seen as a a tragedy and his coming back to life would seem to be a supernatural credential. Who is this? Maybe he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And he comes up out of the abyss. This means that his resurrection has something to do with the reappearance up out of the depths of where the demon hordes come from. There's a supernatural element in this that is dark. And that starts the 42-month time clock of the Great Tribulation. Three and a half years, 1260 days. Where he makes war against the two witnesses, chapter 11. He breaks the covenant with Israel, Daniel chapter 9. He makes war against Israel and the rest of her children, Revelation chapter 12. And the world gets really dark. He is a counterfeit Christ He comes with signs and wonders and miracles. He's got horns. He's got followers. He's got his name written on his followers. All those things are true of Jesus too. He even has a death and a resurrection. And there is something of a Trinitarian imitation going on here. There is Satan unseen behind the scenes. And then the first beast, the Antichrist, he is a supernatural man that is to be worshipped. And then there is the second beast, a miracle working sidekick. He is the first beast agent in the world to induce the world population to worship him. This is the unholy trinity. And this Antichrist will appear to be stronger than death. After so many of the world's population will have died, this will be an attractive deception. The supernatural signs will appeal to the religious impulse of humanity. People all over the world know that there's something bigger out there. There's some power. There's there's something beyond the natural. They've rejected the one true God, but they're attracted to any alternative. Superstitions, aliens, necromancy, witchcraft, new age vortices, crystals, reincarnation. There's something out there. I can just feel it. And a man shows up on the world scene, intelligent, compelling, spiritual. He comes with strength and he brokers peace. And then he's violently killed, but comes back to life and performs otherworldly miracles. He will be the answer the world is waiting for. The world will love the powers and the miracles of Jesus without the demands of the real Jesus. You don't have to repent. <laughs> You don't have to give up your sins. You can have everything you've ever wanted. It's just like the serpent in the garden. The dragon in the final act. Enticing humanity to reject God and to follow him. And the world will do it. The fifth characteristic of the Antichrist is his glory. His glory. He gets an easily acquired adoration, a following, worshipers. Look at the end of verse 3. The whole earth marveled and followed after the beast. He gets worldwide fame. He takes everybody in. And the tragic irony of the Antichrist's work is that he appeals to a world that rejected the death and resurrection of Christ. And now they're duped by a counterfeit. Paul tells us that God is sovereign even over this. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. 
The Antichrist's presence on the earth, empowered by the dragon and deceiving the world, is not something God didn't see coming. It's actually what God gives to the world that rejects the gospel generation after generation after generation. This is a judgment from God. Look at verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who's like the beast and who is able to do war against him? There is adoration for Satan because he's the power behind the wonders, the miracles, this supernatural stuff and this godless answer to the world's problems. And then they worship the beast. By the way, it's interesting Satan doesn't mind if other entities are worshipped besides him. He's not jealous for his own glory the way the one true God is. He's okay if if anybody gets worshipped other than God. He shares this with the beast. And the people of the world find the beast irresistible. Who's like him? Nobody's like him. And who could go against him? Nobody could assemble forces Against his consolidation of power. In fact, Daniel tells us that he acquires the world through a bloodless victory. His ascendancy is so rapid and energized by Satan. That it doesn't come at the end of a long series of of wars trying to conquer the world like all the other empires before. It's just all in his hands. He's a superman. He's a demigod. He's a hero. He's a champion. And the world will say, he's like us. He's a complex character. You know, in in the old Hollywood movies, you had white hat, black hat. You had had the good guys and the bad guys. And, and, And the characters, the protagonists who were the heroes of the story, they did what was right. They had integrity. Hollywood has chucked all of that. Our our heroes now have to be complex characters with with bad histories and and they fail at levels of integrity and, and they're not really good guys. And that sort of brings the heroes down to the level of all the rest of us slime and and we can associate, we can appreciate. The Antichrist will be like that. And nobody will have to apologize for his complex character. They will say, well, the ends are going to justify the means. If we can get world peace. And, you know, some of the miscreants have to get killed for it. That's okay. This is the cruel path he is on. And what the world has hoped for, unity, peace, no borders, uh, a golden age of humanity without religion, the promise of power over death, you can live forever without God. That's all coming under his rule. A 20th century poet by the name of John Winston Lennon, said it this way. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Ah, 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 ah. (laughs) Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You who, ooh, ooh, ooh. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You who, ooh, ooh, ooh. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. What John Lennon sang about is what the Antichrist promises. And a brotherhood of rebellion against the one true God looking for godless solutions to the world's problems. And God will give it to them. For a time and times and half a time. This is the great big kumbaya moment for godless humanity. The progress they've hoped for. 
Look at Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. This is a serious indictment about the human heart. The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship the demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood which which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality nor of their thefts. Humanity at this time will have a white knuckled grip on sin. Can I just have life without God? This world leader can give it to you. And we see the final characteristic in this passage, his arrogance, brazen, fearless, blasphemy. Look at verse five. And there was given to him a mouth in blasphemies speaking great boasts and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. Notice first of all, God's limitation. The 42 months here is important. It's clear that these passive verbs, it was given to him, it was given to him, it was given to him. Just like in the book of Daniel, we saw that over and over and over again. Corrupt, evil, human empires were given things. Who's doing the giving? God is the one ultimately in charge. And here the beast is given his awful reign for 42 months. Satan would not limit this to 42 months. This is clearly God's doing. And there's a comfort in this for us, perhaps a comfort in an election year, that as bad as any government could be, God is sovereign. He's writing history. He is bringing everything to the correct ending, and we can trust Him no matter how bad things get. It's a massive lesson for us in the book of Revelation as a whole. That will be the worst period of human history ever, and God's in charge. And he keeps his people and they persevere to the end. Argument from the greater to the lesser, from the the badder to the gooder. We can trust him in our day. But notice the brazen, fearless blasphemy of the Antichrist and the world that follows him. He blasphemes against God, verse 6, and against his name and his tabernacle and against those who dwell with him. The name of God is the representative for his attributes. It, It represents who he is, his character. This blasphemy is an assault on God's character. And the arrogance, the the brazenness of this Antichrist will assault God's people. It will assault everything having to do with God. Listen, the world has been doing this all along. But it will take a, a universal and outlandish voice in the last days. The attempt to defame God, to rob Him of His glory, to give that glory to creatures... And to give that glory to awful creatures. It is likely that the Antichrist will take to himself the names and attributes of God. Listen, the the world knows something about Jesus. The world knows something about Jesus' return. If If you study Islamic eschatology, you recognize that the world of Islam is waiting for another imam. Who will come to the earth. And who will dominate the earth in one world government to bring all the world in unity and peace back to Allah and Muhammad as prophet. And the one they're waiting for is Jesus to return. Do you understand that in Islamic eschatology, the Antichrist is Christ and Christ is their Antichrist. They've exactly reversed the identities of the players in the end time. And there are a lot of Muslims in the world anticipating these events from a reverse of their truth. 
And and all of those who are in a sort of new age mindset, waiting for some sort of reincarnation, or an eastern mindset, waiting for the next iteration of Buddha, there is a convergence of anticipation that will prepare the world for someone who will bring about peace and call himself Jesus. Our world is ready for this. God told us this will happen. God even called him the anti-Jesus, the anti-Messiah, the anti-Christ. And this desire of this one actually culminates in what Daniel calls the abomination of desolation. The, The emptying of things that makes abominable. Paul describes it this way in 2 Thessalonians 2. He opposes and he exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Think about his career in the last seven years. He will make an agreement with the world so that Israel gets to rebuild a temple that he himself will go into, declare himself to be God and demand the world worship him. The brazenness, the audacity of that kind of blasphemy is stunning. And the world will buy it. The world is ready for it. This this takes us all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 3. What was Satan's appeal to the man and the woman in the garden? Eat of this fruit, you will be like God. Humanity bought it on the first page. Humanity is going to buy it again on the last page. This is the temptation in the human heart to take the one true God and lessen him. Make him more earthy, make him tangible. This is why the Ten Commandments prohibit making any graven image or likeness. You can't condense God down to something you can see and touch and feel. This is why Romans 1 describes this as rebellion against God. They knew God. They did not honor Him as God. They didn't give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their speculations. I'm going to reject the God that I know exists. I'm going to try to think about Him some other way. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images In the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. It is bound up within us in our fallen state to replace God with images of created things. To worship finite things, lesser things, empty things, wicked things. Do you remember Herod? In Acts 12, we... We get this really striking depiction of his going out of this world. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to the people. And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And you want to say to Herod, tell him to stop. Apparently he didn't. An angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. Sometimes God tolerates longer careers of blasphemy than Herod's. Herod was dropped on the spot. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar on the roof of his palace? Walking about, looking over Babylon and saying, I did this. And, and we love Nebuchadnezzar. We think his story turns out good in the end. And you're like, okay, he's an enemy of the people. But then he listens to Daniel and he glorifies God. And you see Nebuchadnezzar walking out on the palace roof, taking glory for himself. And I, no, Neb, don't do that. Don't say it. Are you ever shocked at the world's blasphemies around us? Talking about God, using his name when they don't mean it, ascribing to him attributes that don't belong to him, blaming him for evil. Do you just shudder, waiting for the lightning to strike? Julius Caesar took these titles for himself God manifest. 
Oh, don't put that on the coins. Universal savior of the world. Oh, don't call yourself that Caesar. And the Roman emperors who followed him likewise took names of deity for themselves. You may have seen the YouTube video of Shirley MacLaine. If you haven't, I suspect you may go search for it this afternoon. It's terrifying to watch. She's sitting there with some new age guru on a beach telling her how she needs to think about herself because, you know, she's kind of down and she needs a pep talk. He says, you don't love yourself. How can you expect to love other people if you don't love yourself? And you're going, okay, it's the same old self-love drivel. And he says, you need to learn to say the kingdom of heaven is within me. I love myself. Say it. And she says it. And he says, no, 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 that's not good enough. You need to say, I and God are one. I and God are one. She says it. He says, no, 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 that's not good enough. Here's a better one. You need to say, I am God. Oh, David, I can't say that. You need to say it. And she set this whole thing up. It's her television program. She's leading her viewers to this view. And then she stands on the beach in front of the ocean with her arms outstretched. And she repeats over and over again. I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. And she is about the same size as a grain of sand on that beach. Standing in front of a massive ocean. She's nobody. The one true God has that whole ocean in the palm of his hand. And she is blaspheming arrogantly. Now nobody listens to Shirley MacLaine. But everyone's going to listen to the beast when he says it. And they will bow down before him. How awful is the human heart. How do I apply this to my life? Well, we were, we've been trying to help our kids think through marriage and dating from when they were little. And I'm not suggesting these need to be your household rules, but these were our household rules. You're not going to date till you're out of high school and no crushes, no crushes are allowed. And we're we're talking about marriage and, and, and dating. What is marriage for? What is dating for? Um, and, and, And then we were asking our kids when they were really little, what, what kinds of things should you be looking for in a husband one day when it's time to do that? And one of our daughters said, well, that he's not the antichrist. (laughs) So there you go. There's one application of this passage. Don't let your daughters marry the antichrist. It's appropriate. By the way, you're safe there. Daniel's very clear about this. He actually won't be attracted. He, he will be a, a man of war, not a man of women. So, at any rate, you're off the hook. Here's some application from Jesus in Matthew 24. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. So what if we're not in the generation of the Antichrist? We're in the generation of the David Koresh and the Shirley MacLaine and all of the gurus and all of the religions and all of the people that would lead the world away from truth. Do not be deceived. Listen, we're, we're, not, we're not so easily deceived when Satan walks in the room with a, a pitchfork and horns and a red suit and says, hey, I'm here to kill all of you. Come with me. His deceptions are subtle. His intrigues are effective because he parades as an angel of light. He says, love is love, peace, unity, kumbaya, get together, tower of Babel, speak the same language, make a name for yourself, love yourself. We made all those things sound good. It's just like normal American 21st century vocabulary and they are lies from Satan. Don't be deceived. John the Apostle gives us a good application. 1 John 4, 3. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus 
is not from God. Remember Jesus said, you don't get to God except through me. If you do not confess the son, you don't have the father. Like there is only one way, John 14, 6. And it's only through Jesus. Only through the real Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. You change him, you deny him, you say there is some other way. Listen to what John calls it. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Then he goes on and says, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. You have to understand, biblically, there's a capital A Antichrist and there's a lowercase a Antichrist. Capital A Antichrist is a man in the future who heads up the empire that is the last human rebellious empire of world history. And lowercase a antichrist is the spirit of that man that Satan puts throughout the world all the time. John says, watch out for it. This is a real contemporary warning for us. First John five. In fact, the the book of first John ends this way. Turn there if you will. First John chapter five, beginning in verse 19. Here's John's application of this doctrine. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God And he is eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. What is the takeaway? Don't be deceived. Don't be an idolater. The deceptions are out there. Father of lies rules this world. Don't fall for it. And don't be an idolater. Don't replace God with anything. Don't worship God or don't go, don't worship things other than God. Don't make God other than he is. If you're here this morning and you recognize the world's problems, maybe the problems with the people around you, maybe you recognize problems in your own heart and your own life. If you are looking for a solution apart from Jesus for your problems, You need to know from this passage, God will actually provide that. His name is Antichrist. He'll make promises to solve your problems. And there is a way that seems right to humanity. And the end of it is death. You need to know your problems cannot be solved except for the one true God. The one true eternal life. And Jesus is his name. You need to know him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this truth. It is terrifying. And it is real. It is future history. You have written it. You have warned us. You have told us so that we would know. Lord, I pray that these truths would cause us to run to you in faith through your Son, the Messiah, the true Christ. I pray that we would not be deceived. I pray that we would worship only you. And we thank you that you win. That all of us who belong to you have our names written in the Lamb's book of life and are overcomers by your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.